let's let's start for the this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce you all to and to welcome Helen Livingston, who's the University Librarian of the University of South Australia and has just flown in to us fresh from Singapore. And Kuala Lumpur. And Kuala Lumpur, yes. Where, where you've been from the, at the International Association of Technological University Libraries. Um, Helen, you're uh, known for, as a person who is willing to take risks in uh, libraries to challenge some of these sacred cows. Um, which is important for us all at, at this era of libraries and information science. Um, some people here have heard you at VALA with your controversial talk and also at the National Library Forum last year in Adelaide. Um, we're in a sort of an era where sometimes we face young clients who are 18 and know more about the technology we're using than we do, um, where there's an expectation by students and academics and researchers for speedy deliver, deliver, you know, uh, <coughs> delivery of uh, what they need uh, in one sort of hit. And um, so we are very keen um, to hear what you say and to challenge us. Uh, and after this... You can challenge me. Yes. And after this, uh, Margie Pembroke will actually introduce you all to how we might actually talk about this in groups. So um, let's all welcome Helen to, um, to Brisbane. Thank you. Now, I do walk around a lot, but um, I've been told I've got to stay behind, at least behind here, and that way you won't be able to get at me either. <coughs> Which will be quite good. I hope it all works. Now, for those of you who are old like me, you'll recognise the things that are faintly at the back of this picture. They're called catalogue card drawers. And when you were a gun cataloguer, you used to be able to file above, you used to be able to file below the rod and above the rod. You all remember those days? People were over about 100. Um, I must say, I must be one of the few people left in my library who know the difference between word by word and letter by letter uh, filing too. But, you know, so here we go. Right, now, the reason it doesn't have a uni essay logo on it, because these are my thoughts, not my university's thoughts. Although they are my thoughts in my library, but everybody argues with me so much we haven't quite got to where I'd like to be. But we probably will get there next year. <laughs> and certainly the year after, definitely. Now, I don't mind if you interrupt me on the way through, by the way, but I think because we're going to go in groups, I suppose it would be better if everyone just holds on to their fierce thoughts till later. But I do, I do like a good argument, so don't feel abashed or anything. Or... Okay, now you probably all know about this. This is the definition of a library catalogue. Um, uh, Cutter's objectives of a library catalogue probably haven't changed much in the last hundred and whatever, 30 years. It was to enable a person to find a book of which either the author, the title or the subject were known and to show what the library had by a given author on a given subject in a given kind of literature. And it was to assist in the choice of a book as to its edition and its character, or its topic, which is, means its literary or topical nature. I don't think it's changed. I mean, obviously, people aren't looking for books, but they're looking for stuff. Um, throughout this uh, talk, I've kind of used items, stuff, and other really technical words a lot. I'm just not quite sure how to describe things, because I'm not... There's not... A, even though there's a lot of work being done on cataloging standards, there's not, not, not a lot being done on what is the generic word for library stuff. All right, who's the catalogue for? <clears throat> is it for our users? Oh my goodness, that's got to be sort of skewed. Anyway, not to worry. For our users, we have subject headings. There's a lot of debate, of course, whether they're worth doing or not, whether tags would be better than subject headings. So we, we, what we do is we invest all our intellectual energy into standards to ease discovery. Now, we all know why we've got standards, so we can share things. And so it's systematic for any library user across the world. We collocate like with like. We um, have extended the surrogate catalogue record to be all kinds of things, really. We, people catalogue everything under the sun, from organisations to realia to, I don't know, what else. Um, we have subject headings, as I said, and we have things like LCSH, but are they really helpful? Are they any good? You know, we all know why you might not have them and why you might have them, but, you know, I don't know that they really have really moved with the times. Okay, is the catalogue for inventory control? Well, obviously it is for inventory control, and that was the original purpose of a catalogue. If you think about uh, catalogues going way back in time, they were only about inventory control. They were not discovery tools at all. They were lists of what you had. And the bigger your list was, the better your library was. It was as simple as that. Now, because we can do this, we do do this. We hang everything off the bibliographic record. 
we partly hang everything off the bibliographic record because it's a standardised form. So people could, every library vendor and every library knows what a mark record like, looks like and they can hang things off it. So we hang now hang loans off it. We didn't used to hang loans off the catalogue. They used to be quite separate. They used to be manual systems aside from the catalogue. But once we got integrated library management systems, whoosh, in they came. And that's where they may well stay. Um, we can show an item's physical location on the shelf or whether it's in someone's hand. And that's part of our inventory control. Who's got it? Where is it? So if your asset managers came and said, where are those university assets which show on the university's balance sheets, you could tell them where they were. So the auditor would be quite relaxed it was in the hands of some you know, kid on the Sunshine Coast on the beach. We use the underpinnings of the catalogue to buy our stuff. We use the underpinnings of the catalogue to shelf order in order to stock take. So lots and lots of that is about inventory control. Now, uh, only two weeks ago, I went to a... I've been in Asia for two weeks, and I feel like I've been there for five years. Um, only two weeks ago, I went to a, a library uh, seminar on the value of libraries at, in Canberra. A lot of people confuse the value of libraries, uh, valuing libraries between mar and marketing libraries, and they worried about you know what their value was. But really, this is about the value as a tool is in the inventory control. The university actually really does value your library, and the only way we could do it is through this inventory control. But I would argue there are other ways to have invent inventory control. I mean, after all, if you're a used car parts, if you're a car parts salesman you have some kind of inventory control, you have squeeze of things on your inventory and you manage it okay. If you're in a liquor shop, you have an inventory control. You have an ordering system, you have a check-in system, you have a payment system. You know, you don't have a loan system because you sell everything, but you still know what's going on. So we're not alone in having inventory control needs. But just hang on to the thought, why are we clinging to having our inventory control linked to our catalogue, which has become not an inventory, but in most people's minds, our discovery system. I don't know quite, I should have done some research, but when quite when, I suppose it was the integrated library management system, when we went from having catalogues as inventory to catalogues as discovery. They dread, dread, those dreaded things called tracings probably did. The Paris principles probably did it in 1961. But anyway, not to worry. Now, what exactly are we cataloguing? I hope this all works. I did this animation when I was in Singapore late at night, so I hope it works. Now, this is where we've got a bit of a mixed message. Now, I say we because I'm sure you're all in the same boat. You've got a, you know, it, depending on what day you wake up, whether it's sunny or you've had chocolate biscuits, you have different views on these things. Um, and obviously, I woke up one day and I'd had, um, I'd had a hangover and there was no chocolate in the house. Okay, this is where we appear to have mixed messages. If the catalogue's inventory, which it is, as well as other things, we catalogue the stuff we physically hold and we somehow manage to catalogue the stuff we don't physically hold but that we store somewhere or we have somewhere. All right, now, as you know, we do catalogue our physical items and that's partly the inventory and it's partly for other reasons. But we also catalogue databases. Now, we catalogue databases because it's part of our inventory and people might even know the name of a uh, uh, database. But you have to ask yourself, if we thought the catalogue was a suitable discovery tool, why for the last 25 years have we had lists that look a bit like this one? This one's actually taken from the University of Melbourne, so no one in the room will be blamed. <laughs> and I do want to put mine up because all my stuff would shout at me for picking on me endlessly. So what you can see here is a list. Now their list, as you can see, just in the A's goes 117 databases. A to Z would obviously be rather a lot. And you have to say, now if the catalogue's doing this, <coughs> which it is, why are we doing this? Because if you look up ABC News Online, you'll find the catalogue, but you've also got to find this list. Now, these days, I think most libraries have moved away from keeping these lists manually, and these lists would be driven by the catalogue. So why have we got it? The catalogue's so great. And the list clearly isn't enough, because we've got the catalogue as well. Now, is this going to go back to where I want to go? Sort of. Didn't go back where I wanted to go. Now, the other thing we catalogue is aggregations. You know, we've all got those, like dozens of things. Abacus is always a great one at the moment because it's always in everybody's database. So you look up Abacus, which for those of you who don't know, is actually an accounting journal thing. 
Can, can you call a thing a journal? A journal. And if you if you uh, go through people's catalogues to Abacus, you get this. I'm sure that means a lot to all our users because it sure as hell means a lot to me. So most libraries, if, I think probably all of you will have at least Abacus three times, if not five or seven times. It's also odd numbers you'll find. Um, so there it is. The full text is available from 1997 to the present via this way, the full text from 1965 via this way, and the full text by, by this way. And you have to ask yourself, you know, why isn't that just saying we've got the full text? But it's not, because we catalogue each aggregation. Now, come on, you meant to go back? Will it go back? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure if people are still doing this, and I don't even know if we're doing a own library because I'm about vision and not about actual work. Um, <laughs> do we catalogue websites? We did early on, remember, because, well, actually we do, because a lot of government, web, government thing, uh, information is websites. Um, so we do catalogue websites. And, uh, and we, don't, we obviously don't catalogue all the websites in the world, but we do catalogue websites. And then we get things like this, which is... Um, this is a children's thing, obviously, and I actually got this from Libraries Australia. At the top, you can see the Libraries Australia Gizmonis record, short record, and I clicked on it, and what did I get? I got the flying pig, okay, but oops, it's not actually here anymore. Oh, oh, bad luck. And that's in our national bibliographic database. That isn't from my catalogue. So I don't want to embarrass anyone, since that's why I did this one. And I don't think any of you probably ever had flyingpig.co.uk. It's, it's got a lot of um, fun things for kids. This probably happens all over the place. I know myself, we actually catalogued a lot of things when the RQF was happening, because there's quite a lot of definitions in there. Just go try and find anything on the web about the RQF now, and you'll be, it'll be miserably, you'll be a miserable failure, because it's no longer there. So one trouble with cataloging websites, over which we have no control, is that they just completely disappear. So what are we telling our users? You know, we catalogue books, and if they're not there, they've gone missing, and we'll chase them up. But if we catalogue websites and they've gone missing, stiff G's. So I don't know about this. I'm kind of gone away from it. Now we also catalogue items owned but held elsewhere, which is a fair chunk of what we all hold, by the way. That would be hundreds of thousands of things we all own, but are held elsewhere. And of course we build, busily have in our catalogues things we have access to and we might even buy, particularly patron driven acquisitions. You might think, what's the catalogue then? Okay, this is an example of uh, something that exists that we don't have and it's somewhere else and it's all over the place. It's another a good example of how things can be just everywhere and they get all over, and I've forgotten whose these are. So, so we buy JSTOR and we get it by ProQuest and we get it by two kinds of ProQuest and two kinds of JSTOR. Okay, now you'd all know this graph. I think we've lost something here. Excuse me, I think I've lost some slides. Oh no, I haven't, it's okay. Okay, here we go. This is the Australian and New Zealand expenditure on e-resources going up, up, up. And actually, I think we'll probably find in 2011 it takes a bit of a J curve and just up like that. The libraries in Singapore we visited, the national, well not so much the National Library of Sing Singapore, National University of Singapore, which is like a pseudo-national library in medicine and science, but certainly Nanyang Technical University, which is the next biggest, they are absolutely going mental on, um, you know, um, e-resources. In my own uh, university, we're getting a brand new building on a campus, the library was designed for 800 students and there are 9,000 students on the campus. So we, uh, we finally won the argument we need a new building, partly because the Vice Chancellor walked in at the change of lecture shifts, you know, when everyone was going in and everyone was going out and he couldn't actually get in the doorway. So oh, they really do need a new building. What if you come on a Sunday afternoon? Anyway, not to worry. Uh, and because we're getting a brand new building which is eight storeys tall, the current one's three, and it's much bigger than the current one, we can't fit all our books in it because we have more seats. So we've got to reduce from about 285,000 volumes at that campus library down to 100,000 volumes to fit in this building. And we, the way we're doing it is by going E. So we've actually been given a whole lot of money to go E. So my E is going to go, phew, that's going to be great. But all of this is happening as we go along. So that's the expansion on E resources. Now what else are we cataloguing? We're also cataloguing special collections. Now this is the most interesting part of what we're doing today in the cataloguing world. Most special collections are also going digital because we're making them go digital. 
we in our college and the museum and um, art gallery sectors are, are making museum are making co these collections go digital. These are usually the fairly unique ones. I don't just go so far as to say they're unique, but they're reasonably unique. Most serials collections are digital. Now the Hathi Trust, I didn't update these figures, but they're you know going up in leaps and bounds. At the moment there are 10 million volumes. It's probably about 12 by now, because well a couple of weeks has gone by. Five and a half million book titles, 264,000 serial titles, and of those, 2.7 million are in the public domain. Currently, it's still only a small proportion of Australia, got Australia. That's in, it's in the low, you know, two, three, four percent for Australia. But there's still stuff in there that no, that not hardly any Australian library holds, which you can find in the Hathi Trust. And these are examples of how the whole world's going digital. Now, it's true we can't get to the whole of that, the um, um, Hathi Trust, but the, the um, whole trend is digital. Okay, user behaviour. There is masses and masses of research to show, and we, you all know this. What is the easiest place to start research, according to students? Google. Ask yourself, where do you start your research? And don't feel embarrassed, everyone does it. And as we all know, everything is free on Google. We all know that, that's a well-known scientific fact. <laughs> if I hear one more person tell me that, but everything's on Google, Helen, I will, I will actually will punch them. Then you'll, you'll be sorry. I just, you know, sometimes I feel like leaping across the table and strangling people. But we get the newspapers, they're online. And how do you think they're online? Who pays for them? Okay, so this is what this is what users think. Now, our discovery layers are going some of the way to address this issue that everything's in Google. And, of course, Google Scholar and, and the notions of information that you see about assessing your the, the scholarly worth of something is all part of this. But the fact is, hardly any user goes to the library catalogue first, or maybe second, or even maybe third. If you're a researcher in nanotechnology, I sure as hell don't bet you go to Google, but you don't go to the library catalogue either. So you've got to think about what's the catalogue for, if it's not as the first point to find quality information on a topic. Especially since we all like to pride ourselves thinking we have carefully chosen all those resources for our very own undergraduate students. They're beautiful resources in, in, you know, in conjunction with the academics. We know that these are the needed resources and they should be using them and they're all in our catalogue. However, most libraries have about at least 70% of the collection never borrowed. So we're not doing actually that well on that one. So what's it becoming? Is it an access, is it a provide access for library materials or is it just a database of metadata because these things are really surrogate records for the surrogate real thing for those materials. Just what is it all about? And are we thinking hard enough about what it's about? Okay. Traditionally, the catalogue was via access, you know, was an access to call numbers and locations. But more and more, it just provides a link to online information and less and less to the actual physical thing. And users, of course, have no idea who's delivering it. I have to tell you a little funny story. We, um, we had some very bright university students who were in a graduate uh, program um, and the University hired them as business project officers and we had one who had two degrees, he was a smart young man and I got, we got him to do some virtual maps or real you know, online maps of various campus libraries and the, we used Dewey and the blocks of books were in Dewey runs and he made all these lovely maps and then, and then we uh, reorganised the library so the Dewey runs weren't in the right place anymore. I said, oh Mark, I'm really sorry about this but you're going to have to redo those blocks of numbers because they're now lo no longer right. He said, Helen, I was going to ask you about those numbers do they actually mean anything? <laughs> he honestly thought, he went up there to look up you know, consumer behaviour and it was just sheer good luck that all the books on consumer behaviour were right next to each other. <laughs> so I explained to him that, that they did mean something, but it was secret librarian's business and unless he became a librarian, there was no way I was telling him what they meant. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So all that work you think you're putting in, and this was, this was not a stupid person, <laughs> he just had no idea. It was like weird code. Now we worry a lot about metadata and what it's all about, and that's where a lot of cataloging um, courses are going, speaking more of metadata, which is just a really another way of talking. Metadata standards are just another way of saying cataloging rules. If you want to sound more trendy, don't say cataloging rules, just say metadata standards, and you just sound so good. When I, was, when I had, still had my youth and beauty, I used to go, I used to work as a cataloger in, a, in the St Kilda Public Library. And you'd go to pick up blokes at the pub and they'd say, what are you doing? You'd say a librarian. And honestly, it was like they got the garlic and the crosses out and stepped backwards. 
Oh, bloody hell. And then I got a job with a computer company at the other end of what I was doing in the library. So instead of using their services, I was hoping to provide the services. And so a week later, I go and they say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a systems analyst. Oh, are you, darling? So, who said blokes are simple? Oh, okay, no, who knows? Anyway, we have descriptive metadata, technical metadata. These are all the kinds of metadata you can have. And so really, we talk about the packaging of data. And that's what we do in our catalog. We create metadata and we package it up in various ways. Now, I do not want to get into an argument about who creates the metadata, because at some point, a person does. But for loads of things, a person doesn't these days either. Some smart person can write an intelligence system which can create metadata from the stuff that's just in the record, in the thing itself, if it's digital. So while it's true today, intelligent people create metadata, and metadata overseen by a person is probably better metadata in some ways, or perhaps has more quality. The fact is, there's so much stuff out there, machines do make metadata, so I'm not, I won't go into the argument. Back there somewhere, there needs to be a little catalog in the back room. But these are the kinds of things we create. Because we've created them, because we've helped invent them, in a way, we've kind of, we're urging the catalogue towards an early death. All right, who creates the data? As I said, it's national agencies. They do have cataloguing persons. They create it and flog it to us or give it to us for free. Libraries create it. You will all be creating some metadata. You'll be all cataloguing some things. And this is particularly these days in the era of grey literature and special collections, those Russian pamphlets on something you don't know about, the you know, things you're cataloguing, where someone in a national agency is doing those beautiful printed you know, published books. Publishers. Now, publishers these days use it as a way to sell you things. They, they, you know, by the way, buy this and I'll throw in a free record. And there's lots of commercial entities who harvest these things, hold them, and then sell them back to you, rent them back to you, give them back to you, depending on your deal with somebody. Most libraries can create a weeny, weeny portion of their own metadata, the tiniest bit these days. And, of course, you know, in the old days it was so much better when you were created all yourself. I don't think. I mean, we all have those catalogues who polish records to death. Okay, now, I've got to get to my thing here. Well, the standards are changing, which makes it even trickier. Uh, these standards have been around for some time. In uh, early this year, the um, ALA decided that they would start a transition away from Mark. Now, I just want to remind all you young people in the room, Mark has been around since 1968. Actually, it was around a little bit earlier than that, but it was still in sort of a pilot form. Uh, John Gorton was the Prime Minister of Australia, and Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the Boeing 747 made its maiden flight. Airbags were invented. Apollo 8 orbited the moon. Dr Christian Barnard performed the first heart transplant. And the emergency 911 telephone service started in the USA. Now, there were people today who didn't know there was, it, it never wasn't there. So this is how old it is. And the, the Philadelphia Bank installed the first ATM. So you have to think, it's been a good standard, it's hung around for a while. But given the changes in the world since 1968 and the massive changes in scholarly communication since 1968, it's quite you know, understandable that the, even the moribund you, you Americans have decided that perhaps its day is done. And there's something else to think about doing. RDA, and after a lot of fuss, is uh, next year replacing um, AACR, which has been around for uh, since 1978, which is based on the Paris principles, which have been around since 1961. Um, and I think maybe RDA could be too little too late, because I think they too have missed the boat. It's because we have committee systems and it's a camel, but... Now, aside like this, with this trend is this. I bet yours looks like this too. Now, I can't remember now, unfortunately, whether I kept the high demand loans in this figure or not, because my feeling is if I left them in, the figure would be much lower. There isn't a library in the world this isn't happening to. We've, I've just visited many libraries in Singapore and many libraries, well, several libraries in Malaysia, and they've all got the downward loan. N not all of them are spending as much on electronic resources as we pr would proportionally, but the downward, downward trend is there to stay. It won't get to nothing, so don't worry about that, but it will keep on going down. <coughs> now, this is my... It's a couple of years old now, but it's my... It's a kind of a... My Library Systems, you know, it's a picture from about three years ago. All of yours will look a bit like this, only there's things that aren't here, like the 360, the, you know, provider of serials records and the 
masses of things that aren't there. But this is the sort of systems we've got because the integrated library management system, that red blob, which is the catalogue and all the things that hang off it, just doesn't cut it. So we have all these things. Now, we've got an old and, you know, pretty crummy system, so that's partly why we've got so many extra systems. But this is just the beginning of what we're about. Um, I've just seen a similar picture from someone at Chalmers University in uh, the Netherlands, and his picture looks a bit like ours. Not as colourful, of course, but not too bad. Okay, now typically what we do is we buy a big package of some sort. Uh, we buy it, but then we go to a mark record supplier to say, oh, what's in that lovely package? And, you know, we'll buy it. And then we check what's in it, and we look at all that, and then we download the mark records to our catalogue. Now, we don't have to do that. What we should be doing is not doing that because the thing itself is not in our library. That article, that chapter, that book, that pamphlet is out there at the vendor's site. We actually don't have it on our servers. They probably won't let us have it on our servers, but we certainly don't have it on our servers. So why don't we just buy the package and point to it? That's how we do it. Our, our machines do it. They go to the seller of Mark Records, say, yes, it's that package, tick, whole box. Why don't we just say, we've got that package, tick. And when they come to us, instead of looking at our copied version of the record, they just go straight to the records at the Mark Records supplier. Because live, you know, maintaining servers, loading records, merging records, over, is not a cheap activity, but it's not a very value-added activity. Like, we're not doing anything with those records, by and large. You know, sometimes we might globally add in one whole field to all 70 squillion of them, but we don't really. So this was suggested at the Catalogers Conference. Why are we in the world taking records from faraway sources, dragging them into our catalogues, reproducing them, and then we still don't have the stuff. The stuff's out there. So all of you have got those records to Abacus or the 19th century collections or whatever, and you've replicated them, just like I have, over and over again. So you have, you have four copies, and you all, I have four copies, and you all have four copies. I mean, if there was a sustainable thing about, you know, electrons in catalogue things, we would look just, just really stupid. We wouldn't be green, we'd be dark brown. So why do we do it like we do it? We do it because we're so used to the old paradigm where we had the thing, we bought the record, and the only way you could get to the record was by our catalogue. But if, as you believe, everyone's wirelessly connected now, they, you don't, they're not coming to your catalogue, they're coming, going out there to the world. So why not just leave it out there in the world? We don't own it anyway. So... What we should we be doing? Are we going to keep on keep the catalogue and keep on cataloging? Are we going to continue to buy records? Well, of course we're going to continue to buy records. We're going to catalogue them, for crying out loud. We couldn't possibly afford it. You know, we can't even move away from the big package, even though we know we're being ripped off, because we couldn't afford to even check in the individual serials, let alone anything else associated with it. We've all been layering our catalogues with discovery layers because we all know there's a flaw to our catalogue because it only talks to the stuff we've put in it, not necessarily everything that's possible. And of course, we use the catalogue to maintain loan systems. So are we going to continue to catalogue the stuff we have, that's physical things, the stuff we own but we don't have, aggregations of various sorts, the stuff we rent, which is a fair chunk of what we've got, but we don't actually own it, the stuff we don't own and we don't have, the websites, and the stuff we might own but we don't have it, and we only have it if someone chooses it. Now, that, when you put it like that, that is really stupid because that's what's in our catalogues. So we haven't clearly thought it through. When it was just the stuff we had, that's cool. But now we've got these other categories, the stuff we own but don't have, the stuff we rent but we don't own, the stuff we don't own or have, and the stuff we might own but we don't own, and even if we did own it, we wouldn't have it. It looks pretty stupid. I think it needs a bit of a rethink. I think we should stop copy cataloging. We get those records from somewhere, just point to them. We should stop fussing around about these details. For goodness sakes, when you put anything into Google, that is anything, you get two million hits. Anything. Like, if you go and get two million hits, it's because you can't spell. And even then you get two million hits. Yeah, and, and not only you get two million, and you get to, if you'd said this, you would have got 14 million. We should point to records rather than buying and storing them. We might have to rent the records, but then we rent the stuff, so why not rent the records with it? While I sort of say here we should embrace new stands, but I'm going to think wonder about that. But since I teach cataloging at my university, I'll probably should, I'm going to leave that in for the minute. 
And we have to find ways to incorporate the virtual and physical shelves in the virtual and physical world. Now, we've all, you know, people are working on virtual cat, virtual um, new book displays and so on, everything flicks through. At Curtin, they don't have a physical new book display or a new journal, but they just, it all just flicks through their screens and so on. But if you're standing at the shelf, how can you tell what you've got virtually? So we've got to start thinking we're in this world where we've got physical things and we've got, I won't say virtual, we've got online things. And how can we merge them in every direction? So when, the, when you're on your mobile phone, you don't just see the flashy new covers of the digitised things. You can also see the gold-lettered old things on your shelves. We're going to have to become super efficient and super flexible and work out ways to do this differently because we cannot afford to go on doing what we've been doing. And I think one of the ways to do it is to completely ditch the catalogue. Get a finance management system for your acquisition. I mean, after all, we've all in our universities got uh, procure, oh, isn't that a terrible word, procurement officers who would love to get their hands on procuring all that library stuff. The only reason they're nice to me is I've got all that money to spend and they haven't got it. And we've all got financial systems that invoice and pay. At the value for library thing, someone said, when I was being devil's advocate and saying, well, you, everything is free on Google, so why would we worry? They said, oh, no, no, but someone has to buy it. And I said, but how do people know to buy the paper clips now? How do they know to buy yellow stick stickies? How do they know to buy what colour highlight? Because someone tells them. They just go ahead and buy it. Then they make sure it arrives and it's paid for properly. Oh, but subscriptions, who would care? Give me a break. Like, if you're a finance person, of course you care about subscriptions. You know, and then they say, oh, but, 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 but. We keep up the IT systems. I think, well, do we? Like, wouldn't an IT department do that too? So you've got to really think about this. If you were starting a library today, you know, you're a donor. You're in Hong Kong and you're a donor because this did actually happen in Hong Kong. A donor walked through one of the Hong Kong libraries and saw the students sitting on the floor and said, oh, they need a new building and gave them 10 million US dollars. <laughs> okay, let's just pretend the, the government has some sort of mental glitch and decides to make a new university starting today. Would any of you create a library cataloguing system, anything like what you've got now? Would you, if you want to get somewhere, would you start from here? Like the Irish say, you would never start from here. Of course you wouldn't. You would completely rethink it. We're trapped in the past. We're trapped by old fogies like me. So start thinking differently. Pretend it's next year and you are the university library of U New Butte University. You have got physical collections. You have got archival collections. And you have got masses of digital collections. Would your catalogue look anything like what ours look like? You'd have to be, have rocks in your head. I reckon we should ditch it, ditch it, ditch it. Ditch everything, really. <laughs> I, we, I think we, we, are, we are next year at my library almost certainly going to make it so that the catalogue is invisible to anyone except <coughs> as an in-house tool. They will go by the discovery. They won't actually be... The, at the moment, that catalogue's a bit disappeared, but next year it's going to be completely disappeared. We're going to, it's just going to be a database you point to and you won't know you've found it. Um, and, um, and we're not going to be loading, I'm pretty sure I've got everyone to agree, we're not going to be loading um, records from far away. They're just going to be out there with our stuff. So we just have to think how to do it. Now, there is also a thought about loan system. I don't know if you've really thought about your lending figures, but you could either decide not to lend at all and you've got to come in the library and use it in the library, but that's probably going just a bit far at the moment. But imagine if you didn't have a loan system. What would happen? My library's lending out um, bound journals of stuff. I have to say, it's not a big winner. Like we, have, we have as many as 20 or 30 some weeks. Um, I'm sort of wondering why we bother them, because we have to barcode them and make sure they've got records and not a fiddling about. But anyway, we're doing it. Um, someone told me, and I'm not sure if this is true, that, that the university... No, Imperial College, I think it is, in, in London, they aren't bothering with any kind of security system. They still have a loan system, but they don't care. In my new library, we're going to have one of those book dispensing machines, which I think the University of Queensland got, and that's where the high demand stuff's going, because we know that would get nicked. But the rest, do we really, really care? And would they nick it? You've all heard stories of libraries being unfortunately open. Uh, we, this happened to us, it also happened to the University of New South Wales. On Australia Day two years ago, the automatic you know, building system thing, whatever it is, uh, opened the doors of one of our campus libraries and didn't turn the lights on, but did open the doors. And we only knew this had happened because the self-checkout machine had loads of transactions for the day. <laughs> 
They didn't wonder why it was fairly quiet, but people actually borrowed. They couldn't just walked out the door. They borrowed books. And it happened, I think, the UNSW, the same thing. The thing came on, and they only knew, because they hadn't yet checked their log, because why would you check the log for a day you meant to be closed? Because somebody complained that the library service that day was pretty crummy. <laughs> So while we think we're essential, perhaps we're not. Um, I think we're essential in many other ways, but don't, so don't get me wrong. But the thing here is, you know, you have to start to think, like, what are they stealing? And if all the high demand stuff is there electronically, the best thing about it, it is pretty hard to pinch. But, you know, there, we are still at the moment where there are things to steal. And, and I'm sure we don't want to steal our beautiful art books and our rare things. But we sort of make it hard to get at your rare special things, and we, we would continue that. But, but do we really need these very complicated loan systems with incredibly compl complicated matrices of who can borrow what for how long? Do we have to be this heart bad at it? Do we have to be really, like, like librarians, ailingly retentive about it? We don't have to be. You look at, like, you know, we've already chopped ours down a fair bit. And I have to tell you, the biggest barriers to making this simple are my own staff. And all of you I know are not like that, but you have colleagues who are back home who will be like that. So just try to think how it might be in the new world where you'd have a different kind of loan system, or not one at all, where you have a different kind of buying system that's not necessarily related to your inventory control and where you'd go with it. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> I am a cataloger. I grew up as a catalog. I love cataloging, and I teach cataloging. But, <laughs> but I still don't think the catalog's necessary. Cataloging is necessary. And, and, and they can go wild. Statements are fine. Outrageous statements are good. I have lots of brothers and sisters, so I don't mind a good argument. Uh, any questions before we go on to the next sort of process? Um, I was going to suggest that we stay grilling time. Oh, uh, until we had our panel, panel back together. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. All right then. All right then. Well, let, let me do the. No one's throwing anything at me though. No, no. I'm no, throw some <laughs> Thank you, Helen, for talking with us. This is what we needed to hear. It's actually slightly more complex than the version I heard, which was a separate yeah. of the catalogue without, but that does actually fill in some of the things. So, look, thank you for flying from. Kuala Lumpur <laughs> to be Oh, I would have stayed in Kuala Lumpur if I had to come No, I would have to come home eventually. My husband um, would forget who I am. Oh, right. And some gifts to oh, thank, thank you very you much. Oh, thank you so much. And thank so, you. Uh, Margie will introduce us to the next process.